Well, I trust you've enjoyed our little journey down memory lane with Brother Olaf. And say we've got some unusual stories coming up. In fact, the next one, after the song, uh, Brother Olaf will talk about his boyhood days. Before he does, I'm going to have the Honeybee Quartet come and have the song, and then Brother Olaf will tell us about his precious dad. And so my knee. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace that bought my liberty. I do not know just why he came to love. As a little freckle-faced boy, coming up in a very moderate family, worked so hard. My dad was severely criticized because his boys worked so many hours. I'll guarantee you it would be called child abuse now. Of course, I thought it was then. I mean, that's before I was ever born, but I thought it was something like that. <laughs> But my daddy worked right with us. He didn't get in the pickup and go to town and drink beer while his three boy brother, he's out there, we was all sweating together. He taught us the lessons of our life. And as a result, we've never had to depend on the welfare for a living. Neither did he. But back in my early days, I was around the colored people. And uh, I can remember the names, Julius Barron, that's Sonno's dad. And uh, uh, I remember his sisters and brothers, and Buddy and, and uh, Owen and so forth. But... I'd go down, and I, my happiest moments were down at the colored people's houses. One reason, I was the king for the day. I was the master's son. I mean, I was the farm owner's son. I was Mr. Harry's son. I was Lester. I'd go down there, and uh, they were not drinking they were not cursing. They were not filthy. And uh, I'd walk in, and they'd all be sitting around, just a talking and laughing. And oh, the moments would pass so fast while I was down there with Sonno. And uh, I, I just, somehow or another, there were times when I felt like I'd been cheated because I was white instead of black. I really. I mean, I just loved to be, they were so happy. And they, they could do everything better than anybody else. Really, it's the truth. Son, oh, he could beat me doing anything. But they'd ask me, they'd say, here come lost. <laughs> I'd walk in and uh, they'd say, lost. I tell you what we'd do. We'll give you a 
nickel to walk like a man. Brother, what a challenge. You think now, a little old bitty boy, and they, they wanted me, and brother, I'd walk like a man. You know, I've always wanted to be a man. From the time I was a little boy, I thought I'd never get big enough to get out of them knee breeches. Pongee shirt. Homemade. My brothers got long trousers and nearly wore them out before I ever got to hand me down. Brother, there's something wonderful about being a man for the Lord. Amen. I like that verse that says, Behold the man, greatest man that ever lived. Oh, I don't only want to walk like a man. I want to walk like the man called Jesus. He was a walker in the faith. Jesus will walk with me down through the valley. Jesus will walk with me over the plain. When in the shadow or when in the sunshine, if he goes with me, I shall not complain. Jesus will walk with me he will talk, with me he will walk, with me. In joy or in sorrow, today and tomorrow, I know he will walk with me. Jesus will walk with me in life's fair morning. And when the shadows of evening must come, living or dying, He will not forsake me. Jesus will walk with me all the way home. Jesus will walk with me, He will talk. With me he will walk with me. In joy or in sorrow, today and tomorrow, I know he will walk with me. And thank God for his promise, he will never leave us nor forsake us. Well, Brother Olaf and I had a lot of things in common. One was our automobiles, that is, the beginning days. And my first automobile was a 1921 Model T runabout, and uh, bought it for $50. And Brother Olaf tells us a story about his experiences with the old Model T. He <clears throat> reminded us one time that uh, he was left alone at home, and... Uh, he, of course, like boys looking for something to do, uh, found some old uh, rags and had a kerosene bucket there, kerosene can, and uh, he thought uh, that'd make a nice torch, so he uh, got a big old piece of bailing wire and tied a rag on the end of it and sopped it down in that kerosene and set it on fire. And he thought that was the greatest thing. I put it out a couple times. And... Uh, then he thought, now, how high could I throw that and uh, watch it, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> like a big torch? So he uh, <clears throat> dunked it down that kerosene again, set it on fire and twirled it around his head and shot it up in the air. And, boy, that was the grandest thing. And he did that several times. And he said uh, <clears throat> the last time he did it, he really wound up and let that thing go. And uh, <clears throat> he said just when he let it go, he heard that Model T sound with his daddy coming down the lane. And, boy, he was crying for that torch to get out of the sky. Come on down. And he said, as soon as that Model T rolled in the yard, another fire started. 
and uh, his daddy started that one. But uh, here's his story about the Model T with an unusual situation. I was thinking about that old team model. My daddy had a way of convicting me. Back in the days when I, were, I was coming up, we had what we call a, a, a car shed. We didn't call it no garage. To me, a garage is some place you take your car to get it fixed. But uh, we had a little old car shed, and it'd go up, and there was boards in there. That was back when people took care of the equipment. I want you to know, listen, that old team model eased up in there, and my dad pulled up that emergency and cut off that uh, team model motor, and then we closed the doors. Homemade doors, of course, and we closed those doors and put the plank in those two slots and it's locked up. And my daddy, I can see it and remember, and that old T model, if somebody asked me if I could drive it, I said, no problem at all. I mean, I cut my teeth in a T model. And, uh, but uh, my daddy went out and, and he, on some cold morning, some cold morning, he'd He'd go around, of course, we didn't have any self-starter. Boy, that's a newfangled invention. <laughs> we had to crank it to front of it. Oh, how many arms have been broken cranking the team model? That's right, you better watch that spark. <laughs> But anyhow, my daddy would get out and he'd wind that thing up and he'd crank and directly he'd peep his head out, you know, he's sweating up a storm on a cold morning. He says, Sally! Bring the tea kettle. You know what that means? He's going to heat her up. Boy, he took off that brass radiator cap and poured that hot water in there, you know, and he'd get out and crank again. My daddy was red in the face, and he'd crank. And Brother, when my daddy gets going like that, don't get in his way here. I mean, don't cross him, see? I mean, I don't know what he thought, but uh, he was careful about what he said. But uh, he was trying to crank... And the next step, he said, I'm going to jack up the hind wheel. And he'd take that little old jack, you know, and go out and see that little old wheel, you know, and he'd go backwards and forth, and after a while, that thing would get started. But one morning, my daddy went out, and he didn't have trouble getting it started. I had all the trouble that morning myself. My little sister, Thelma, and you girls will be interested in this, she was younger than... And Lester and I was the youngest boy. It became my lot to play with Thelma. And oh, listen, you talk about dolls, you talk about uh, nice things, she had them. She was the only little girl in our family with three boys. And she came along sort of last. And so it'd be my. And so one day I got one of her most beautiful dolls. I mean, That is back in the days. seemed like the dolls were prettier then. seemed like they're sort of mechanical looking now, you know, sort of dumb looking. But back in those days, the little dolls, they just looked like a little baby. And I took her most precious doll. Not because I loved dolls. I didn't. I was a boy. I'd on my way to making a man. had a hard time getting there, but I wanted to be a man. It is a burden to me. My mom would say, Lester, now you go play with Thelma. I said, Mama, I'd rather go ride old day. said, you go play with Thelma. Now, she don't have anybody to play with. I'd go in there, and I'm telling you, Thelma would make all sorts of hot cakes, and she'd cook up a meal, and I'd have to sit there and make out like I was eating them mud pies and all of that. <laughs> well, that is a... Huh? And so one morning, I just kind of, I guess, got disgusted, and I thought, well, I'll just try me something. I took that little old doll, and I got it, and I eased out to the car shed. My dad had already opened the doors, and he got in the old T-model. He didn't go around like he did. Old uh, Dave told me a while ago, said, there's the door, and they said, my dad never did go around getting the door. He just threw his foot over the outfit, you see, and sit down in it. And, and uh, sissies went around the other side and got in. But anyhow, uh, I took that doll, and when my daddy got in the car, nobody was watching. I took that doll. And I put it, the head, right down under the back wheel. I mean, that doll head right there. And then I, I, I backed off to watch and see what was going to happen. 
And you believe me, it happened. I want you to know it happened. Listen, I saw him. He put that old Ford, that old T model in reverse in the middle, you know, and he put, and he pushed down. I heard it. And it just didn't want to go right quick, you know. And all of a sudden, boom! He ran over the head of that dog. It sounded like a shotgun. I said, I didn't intend for it to do that. My daddy jumped out of that thing. He run around there. And he looked at nothing but the torque or the body or whatever it is. Just no head. The thing had exploded, just busted all the pieces. And, of course, he didn't say, Sonny or Honey. He said, Lester. I said, Yes, sir. And that's where the fireworks started. Brother, one of the hardest, to the tune of Thelma's weeping. And, of course, I joined her. We both wept. For different purposes, but we wept. She wept I ball. There's a difference. Well, he brought real conviction. He made me realize I had done wrong. And that's the last time he broke me from breaking little dolls' heads under the back. Well, many were the experiences of the home life down on the farm with Brother Olaf. I remember him telling the story soon after he had received his uh, twin engine license and he got a twin engine airplane and he wanted to show it to his dad and mom and so he just flew it down to the farm and was going to land in the back pasture back there and the old farm road, you know, going down by the field. And so he proceeded to do so. And uh, he came into land, and uh, he realized when it was too late that he forgot to let the uh, landing gear down. And you talk about dust flying now as this twin-engine plane got down that old dusty road, and he set it down. And believe it or not, it didn't crash, didn't tear up the airplane ex extensively. And uh, he finally ground her to a halt with the dust of flying and everything, and his daddy came out to see what had happened, and yeah, he walked up to the airplane, and he, Brother Olaf stuck his head out, and his daddy said, uh, Son, looked like you got a got our high center, didn't you? And, of course, you would understand that if you ever rode in Model, model T's on the old rut uh, road, and uh, the ruts were deeper than the uh, uh, differential, and so what you did was, uh, you just got high center. Well, <laughs> not only did uh, Brother Olaf's dad uh, uh, furnish a lot of experiences in Brother Olaf's life, but his dear mother as well. And uh, he's going to tell us about uh, his mother that just didn't believe that he could do anything wrong. My mother, and she was so full of mercy and forgiveness, and she was so tearful when something went wrong with me. And even in my sin days, when uh, their hearts were broken, and uh, when I've seen my mother with golden tears chasing each other down her cheeks, and, and she'd say, Son, it wasn't your fault. Oh, it just wasn't your fault. But it wasn't my fault. But she didn't believe it. I remember when the old boys, old Cat Brown and Odell, and, well, all the rest of them would go home with me. After God called me to preach, and I'd go to the little country church and preach. And the people... They respected and loved me. And the old-timers were so kind and would so encourage this young preacher to keep on keeping on. And the young people would come with whom I was brought up, and they'd go home with me and back to the old homestead there. And my mother would plan for 15 or 20, and oh, the big long homemade table and benches and chairs and all the rest of it, and the old tablecloth and all the nice things and the big four-layer cakes that my mama would stack up. And uh, one of the things that always puzzled me when I was a little child is how in the world my mother 
could guess just how much spilling she needed. And I'd stand there and drool all over the kitchen, waiting for the pan. I mean, just wait for the pan. Chocolate, that's back in my chocolate days. And all the rest. And I'd just stand there and wait and wait. And, and she'd just put it on top of every layer. And then when she got the top covered, she'd go around the whole thing. Round and round, and I'd stand, and I'd wait. And quickly she'd say, now, son, you can lick the pan. I said, yes, ma'am, that's about all there is left. It's just the pan. <laughs> ah, listen. But when we'd come home after the morning service, we'd sit at the table, and old Cat Brown and old Dell and all the rest of them, I tell you, mischievous as we used to be. They said, Ms. Roloff, uh, do you remember when Lester uh, did so and so? And my mother almost turned into an angel, and she said, No, I don't remember. I don't think he ever did that, did he? You don't remember? No, she said. I, I, all she could think about is her preacher boy standing in the pulpit, telling about Jesus. All the force of my life were gone. All the mistakes and all the hot tears that rolled out of her cheeks have been dried away. Amen. As I stood in the pulpit and called sinners to repentance. Brother, that's a little like God, isn't it? I'm glad He's forgiven and He's forgotten. Ain't no need you reminding God of my past sins. He ain't going to remember them. He may rebuke you for even bringing them up. None of your business. I'm glad that's true of you too. You little girls that come in. You precious old boys with your white shirts on. With an old ugly, dirty past. Many defeats and running from the law. Laying in some old cold, clammy jail. Day and night. And yet, God's forgiven. All that's in the past. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Your name's been written in the book of life. God's kissed all your sins away. Don't have anything to worry about. Nothing. Oh, one day, somebody told me, it must have been the Lord. He said, you don't have any more to worry about than God does. And God never worries. Look at my watch, but I'm through now. Back in my boyhood days, I guess the most exciting time, the most fearful time, the most frightening thing, I was the most nervous. I was more nervous than everybody else in the family put together. I was scared of the dark. I was scared of everything. I mean, I was nervous. I couldn't sleep. I, I had at least, I rode probably six nightmares a night. And I never had a saddle on one of them. I still have them. And the other night, the other night, right, I mean last week, I looked up. And I don't know why it had to be a colored man, because I've loved them. They've been my friend. We played together. But a colored man came at me last week, one night last week. And I want you to, he filleted me. He said, I've never felt such a sharp knife. Pew, pew, pew. He cut me all to see. If I hadn't woke up when I did, I'd have been done forever. I know I never would. <laughs> now you talk about a nightmare. I had it. That is a nightmare. It's a horrible time. But oh, isn't it blessed to wake up? <laughs> Boy, you, you, you kind of enjoy the nightmare then because it feels so good not to be hurt. My, listen, I heard so many nightmares until I, I really lived my name. I rolled off the bed many, many nights. But I'd hit the floor, my head, had, and, and we didn't have carpet. Fact is, we were just delighted to have wall-to-wall -wall floor. And uh, I'd hit that old hard, cold floor, and my mama would say, Lester, did you have a bad dream? I said, it's over. I'm all right. You know, and I'd climb back on the bed and try to go to sleep again. Well, I know what it is. I know what it is. But one day we went visiting. We came back. And uh, you talk about some excitement. We walked in that old ranch home. And listen, I'll guarantee you, in there... In the, um, in the kitchen, in the, what we call the dining room, where the old homemade table, 
was a great big pool of blood, human blood. And oh, listen, man, it scared me so bad. I was the least one in the family. And I stayed so close to Mama, and she got away from me. I grabbed my papa, and we walked down the hall, and there was a trail of blood. And we went in the room, in, the, in, in, the, in what we call the front room. And there was a little chair, Pam, uh, Elizabeth Ann. No, not Elizabeth Ann. Uh, Thelma's little chair. And she was, and whoever came, sat in that chair, and the blood ran out on the floor. Oh, listen, we trailed right on down the hall and went out to the chicken trough, a round concrete chicken trough, and it was filled with blood. First, he'd washed himself off, and we knew there had been something horrible happen in that, uh, that, that our house that day. And oh, listen, we just, we, we were perplexed, and, and finally we began to search and to look, and we found out that uh, my neighbor, my playmate, Edwin Jordan. Now, when they moved to town, they call it Jordan, but it was Jordan back in those times. Mr. and Mrs. Jordan and Edwin would come. And so, he walked up the road, he got up home, and he said, um, a colored man shot me down at Mr. Roloff. Oh, listen, they called Dr. B.W.D. B. Hill. He jumped in an old T-model and phew, he came down those old dusty roads and he came in and he looked and sure enough, a hole went all the way through, all the way through, right in here. You know what happened? Dr. Hill, wise old Christian doctor, said, Edwin, what happened? He said, a colored man shot me. Down at Mr. Roloff's, and he said, uh, he shot me right. And Dr. Hill took his hand. Now, in the meantime, Mr. Jordan had buckled on his big 44 and gone down to Mr. Roloff's. And he was on a manhunt. That big old pistol hanging on his hip. Ready to shoot anybody, black or white, red, pink or brown, that might have shot his boy. Talking about something tonight. Dr. Hill, he raised up his hand and he said, Son, it's awful black around there. He must have been mighty close to you. He said, Edwin, did you shoot yourself? And tears started rolling. Not dismayed, whatever the time, God will take care of you. Beneath His wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day. Or all the way, he will take care of you. God will take care of you. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and will open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Patiently, tenderly pleading, Jesus is standing today. At your heart's door, he knocks as before. Oh, turn him no longer away. Don't turn him away. Don't turn him away. He has come back to your heart again, although you've gone astray. Oh, how you need him to plead your cause on that eternal. 
eternal day. Don't turn the Savior away from your heart. Don't turn him away. Well, I'm sure you related to some of those things that happened in Brother Olaf's life. I certainly have many, many times. And some of the uh, just down-home sayings that he would give in the middle of his preaching. No more conviction than a dead mule, <laughs> Brother Olaf have said, and blinder than a bat backing up. 